Hi folks and welcome. Today's pre-narrated, pre-recorded narrated lecture is for chapter three, electronic structure and periodic law. <clears throat> so in this chapter we're going to be discussing um, quite a few of the sections within chapter three. Again, please refer to the suggested readings as well as the uh, topics that are covered in depth in this course. So the first thing that we're going to discuss is the concept of periodic law. And basically what's happening here is when we look at a periodic table, we are able to make predictions about elements that come after certain other elements um, before <clears throat> our periodic table was as full as it is now. Um, we were able to use the periodic law and the concepts of this to help predict uh, elements that had yet to be discovered. Um, and they were correct in their predictions. Um, <clears throat> so the idea here is that um, we can use the periodic table and periodic law as a way to kind of organize the elements in a way that we can see similarities between different elements, as well as notice trends that occur. And the first person to do this <clears throat> uh, was a Russian scientist, and what ended up happening was he organized the atoms in terms of relative mass. And so when we think about relative mass, in this case we're probably talking about an increase in, in um, protons, right? Because protons and neutrons are where the bulk of the mass for an atom comes from. So here um, are the first 20 elements um, in an order in which they are increasing in their relative mass. What ends up happening is they notice um, certain trends or certain properties of those um, elements kind of would be in these repeating patterns. And what we see is, for example, let's say uh, helium is, uh, the greens are very stable gases at room temperature. Um, the red ones blow up in water, things like that. And we would see these trends happen again and again. Um, these properties show up in, in this pattern. So what ended up happening um, was if we start kind of organizing um, those elements to have the repeatable properties near each other, we end up with something that looks like this, which is very, very similar to our modern periodic table. You can kind of start seeing, you know, the remnants of what will become um, the periodic table as we know it today. So when we have these patterns, <clears throat> um, there are always going to be um, observations for these laws, right? So think back to like a chapter one discussion about what is the difference between a law and a theory. A law is just something that occurs. So we see this repeating pattern occurring. Um, but behind a law is observations and <clears throat> A why it is occurring is the theory. Um, for right now and for the depths of this class, we will just be kind of saying this is periodic law. We're not going to go into too much um, examining the theories behind this law. Um, if you wish to discuss them further, I'm happy to do so, um, but not something that we're going to delve too deep into in this class. So here's a more modern periodic table <clears throat> um, where we can see the organization that started out um, has been more fully um, expanded upon. We have uh, different groups within the periodic table. And the periodic table as we know it today um, is uh, organized by increasing mass. We have mass numbers, which we now know mean um, <clears throat> that we have an increasing number of protons present. Last thing here, again, um, we'll talk about this more, but the different colors here represent different types of elements. So the majority of the periodic table is made up of metals. These blue ones are metals, these yellow ones are non-metals, and the ones that are along this step here in green are the metalloids. So there are two ways we can organize the periodic table in terms of their grouping. We can look at groups, or sometimes called families, and these are the vertical columns, so the up and down. Or we can look across a period, which would be a horizontal row. Um, one of the easier ones to remember, I think, are the groups or families, and that's because these will share similar traits, just like you share traits with your family members, whether they be physical or, um, you know, personality traits, you share similar traits with them. Similar, uh, just identically, <clears throat> Uh, elements in the same row share similar properties as well. 
We have a few groups that we name specifically. There are some that don't have any name to them, but you should be comfortable with the concept that the A1 column or the first column all the way to the left are the alkali metals. After that come the alkaline earth metals. We have this group here in the center called transition metals, and we're going to learn a lot more about them in a little bit. If you remember from doing some nomenclature that um, transition metals um, <clears throat> are the ones that can change their um, ionic state. Then we have uh, com or common, non-common ones, the halogens, and then the noble gases. So there are five main groups that you should be comfortable with identifying on a periodic table. These are just examples of some of the different uh, elements that exist in these uh, different groups. Group one, the alkali metals. These metals are typically soft metals, so you would you know, really kind of be able to like cut or bend them to break them. They all like to explode in water. Um, if we were looking at something like the halogens, most of these are gases. If they're not gases, they will readily become gases. So here, bromine is a liquid, but when in a container, will readily become a gas. Uh, chlorine gas is obviously very, very dangerous. We actually use iodine chambers, um, like you see here, um, to <clears throat> process fingerprints and things like that. So when we look at the periodic table, again, we want to be understanding the concept that we are also organized by the groups of different kinds of elements, so metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Please understand that hydrogen, even though it hangs out on the left-hand side of the periodic table, it really is not a metal. It doesn't act like uh, it doesn't have properties of a metal. Um, in certain respects, I guess you could make the argument that it might act like some metals, but um, it is not a metal. So metals, with the exception of hydrogen, are on the left side of the table. Typically, we consider them solids, um, with the exception of mercury. Um, shiny, ductile, they conduct heat, electricity, sometimes they're malleable. Non-metals are on the right-hand side of the periodic table. Dull, brittle, poor conductors, but good insulators, have low densities and relatively low melting points. Um, so this means that while some of them uh, may be solids at room temperature, they're going to melt much sooner than like a metal would melt. And then metalloids kind of exist, uh, exhibit properties of both metals and nonmetals. They can be conductors, but they're not as good as metals. They can be insulators, but they're not as good as nonmetals. They can act as uh, semiconductors and things like that as well. So the next way we can start looking at our elements is to start looking at the number of electrons that each element, or excuse me, each atom has. Um, and different elements will have different arrangements and numbers of electrons. Um, <clears throat> most of chemistry in terms of the action, like the exciting chemistry that occurs, chemical reactions, are interactions that occur between electrons. So the electrons are, are the meat and potatoes of chemistry in terms of the things that change chemical compositions and, you know, exciting reactions and things like that are often the giving and taking of electrons or the sharing of electrons. Um, so electrons are very, very important, even though they're so, so small. So typically, um, we need to come up with ways that we can kind of organize um, the electrons in an atom and kind of understand where they are and who's doing what. Right, because we just said the electrons are the things that are going to go do the chemistry. So we want to be able to kind of call out what electron we're talking about, where they're going, where they're coming from, all that kind of stuff. So this next little bit that we're going to talk about really is to help us understand um, where electrons are. If we wanted to call out a specific electron, how we could identify it and things like that. So within uh, a single atom or, or any atom, Electrons are arranged in what we call specific energy levels, or you could think of this as like shelves, right? If the nucleus of the atom was down here, these would be the shelves um, that the electrons lived in. So you could think of this in a spherical type uh, arrangement, but obviously here we're just showing it in 2D. And so each shelf, as we go from the lowest bottom shelf, which would be closest to the nucleus, up to N of 7, 
potentially we could say n of infinity, um, but basically lots and lots of shelves. The further the shelf or the energy level is away from the nucleus, <clears throat> the more energy those electrons carry. And we can think of this in terms of uh, if the books fell off the bush bookshelf, there would be um, more potential energy that could be turned into kinetic energy for a book that is way up on the top of the shelf to fall than a book on the first shelf to fall. Um, so we call each level, um, and we represent it by the letter N, lowercase n, and we just count them. So the first level that is closest to the nucleus is one, and then two, three, four, five. It is also important to note, um, this was purposely done, this isn't just for a pretty art, that the jump between n equals one and n equals two is bigger than the jump between two and three, and the jump between three and four, and the jump between four and five, and so on. So the shelves get smaller and smaller in their distance from one another the further out they go. Um, electrons that all live in the n equals one shelf or energy level are all going to have equivalent energies to each other. No one is going to be higher in energy or lower in energy. Um, but the n equals two electrons are going to be higher in energy than the n equals one electrons. But if we compared electrons within the n equals two um, energy level, they would all be the same. So we're going to start talking about how we arrange these. You may have uh, experienced uh, this type of what we call electronic configuration before, and you may have been very frustrated with it. So we're going to go through this a couple different ways with a couple different um, kind of learning techniques to it and maybe one of them will fit you better for understanding than another one will. So the reason we care about this, the reason we want to know the arrangement the electrons are in around the nucleus, you know, how which energy levels are they sitting in, how many are sitting in each energy level, um, this really determines the physical and chemical properties of that element. So it's an important aspect of chemistry. Um, <clears throat> each energy level, this n equals 1, n equals 2, 3, 4, has little like sub-levels in it. So the way I like to explain this is to think of it almost like, a, like an apartment building where the energy level is like the floor and then within that floor there could be studio apartments, there could be one bedroom apartments, there could be two, three, four bedroom apartments, five bedroom apartments, seven bedroom apartments. It's, it's a very big apartment complex, but that's kind of one way to look at it. We could think that within the apartments, uh, the number of bedrooms would be how many electrons, you know, could sleep in there and that kind of thing. So I'll use that analogy occasionally to kind of help us what's going on. Uh, officially, we uh, identify these sublevels as either sublevel S, P, D, or F. S would it be basically like a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, P would be a three-bedroom apartment. D would be a five-bedroom apartment. And F would be a seven-bedroom apartment um, in terms of how many electrons we could sleep in there. So within one energy level, so let's say we were looking at the N equals four energy level, so the fourth floor of our apartment complex, the S energy levels are lower in energy than the P, which are lower in energy than the D, which are lower in energy than the F. And when we think about this, if we're going to use the analogy of the apartment complex, we'll say the S is closer to the elevator than the P, than the D, than the F. So it takes less energy for you to go from, you know, the, the uh, elevator to the S apartment. And then it takes a little more energy to walk down the hall to get to the P apartment, and a little more energy to walk down the hall to the D and the most energy to get to like the F. <clears throat> so <clears throat> these orbitals and these sublevels, uh, sometimes they are described as these um, kind of like the planet and the sun, um, which is the Bohr model, which uh, works really well for working with one electron systems and for the purposes of what we kind of talk about uh, is not a bad representation of um, 
you know, what's going on, right? When we think about, okay, if I had the sun in the center and the sun was the nucleus, then the electrons are all the planets around it. It's, it's not a terrible idea of how it works, but it's not totally accurate. We need to think more 3D space. So what we end up thinking about is <clears throat> these S, P, D, and Fs as kind of these uh, probability bubbles of where the electron could be. So S orbitals are spherical. That means somewhere within this ball, this sphere, is an electron. If the center of it is the nucleus, the S orbital is a sphere around the nucleus. It can exist somewhere within that ball of sphere. As we go up in n's, so when we go from n1 to n equals 2 to n equals 3, the orbitals get bigger. Not only with the s, it will happen with the p, the d, and the f as well. You should be comfortable identifying what shapes each of these orbitals have. So s orbitals tend to have a spherical shape to them, which is nice and easy because s is, starts with an s and sphere starts with an S, so it's a spherical um, shape. The P orbitals are a little trickier. They look like a bow tie, some people call it a dumbbell, um, but it's this double lobed shape and there are three of them. They exist in the X, Y, and Z plane. So if you were thinking about 3D space, we have one of these lobes sits in the X plane, one sits in the Y plane, and one sits in the Z plane. And if you overlap them on top of each other, it kind of sort of resembles a sphere again. Again, remember this is in 3D space. Um, what's tricky with the lobes is that, again, this represents the likelihood of where we're going to find an electron, but it's not like it exists in this lobe or in this lobe. It's just this whole space. Uh, anywhere within this space that we can find it. So as we start counting our electrons, there's kind of some uh, weirdness that starts going on with the pattern. Um, and you may have seen a chart like this before if you've tried to do um, uh, electronic configuration before, and this may have not worked very well for you. Um, I find this chart to be very confusing in terms of um, trying to memorize it or learn it. I prefer to just utilize the periodic table and learn some tricks with that. But I will go through this just in case this is what clicks for you. As we go uh, through different atoms that have different numbers of electrons, we add uh, sequentially different numbers of orbitals and suborbitals to it. So we would go from n equals 1, which only has an s orbital, to n equals 2, which has an s orbital and a p orbital, to n equals 3, that has an s orbital, a p orbital, um, s equals 4 has an s orbital, but then we go back to the 3p because it's actually higher in energy. And this is where people start getting confused, where before everyone's like, okay, I can get behind this one to two, and it's S and the P, and then S and P, but then here we go S, and then we're back to the 3D, and then we go to the 4P, and then we go back to the 4S, the 5P, to the 6S, the 4D, and people start getting confused. And this is why I'm not a huge fan of um, this system. Um, but in each of these little boxes here, we can fit two electrons. So if we had a system where we had an atom that has 13 electrons in it, we would count out and we would be able to say where all the electrons are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 13. Sorry, I said 13. So right here, these orbitals and suborbitals are where all the electrons in an atom with 13 electrons hang out. And we can learn things about um, what they're able to do chemically, what kind of bonds they can make, all that kind of stuff based off of the electronic configuration. So <clears throat> uh, when we're writing uh, or trying to figure out these um, you know, where all the electrons get filled out, uh, there are some rules to how we do it. And so when we have <clears throat> uh, these orbital diagrams, we call them, or just basically these boxes, um, they have to be filled out in a specific way. 
uh, each s orbital, right? Remember, s's are a level on the shelf. Um, and so we have only in, or in the n equals 1 orbital, or energy level, we only have one s orbital. That's it. A singular s orbital. So that is known as the 1s orbital. When we get to the second energy level, or the second row on the shelf, that has an s orbital and a p orbital. So the s orbital has, uh, can fit two electrons in it, and the p orbital would be able to fit six. So if we go back to our analogy of um, the apartment complex, s orbitals are the one bedroom apartments. It has one bed in it, and it can fit two electrons in it. Um, the other thing that you'll see here is the electrons are pointing in opposite directions. This is because they're going to spin in opposite directions. So electrons are always moving. And if they spin in opposite directions, they're going to um, be able to kind of withstand being closer to each other instead of if they were spinning in the same direction, there would be more repulsion. Um, so we can pretend that these are uh, electrons sleeping in a bed where it's like head to foot, right? So <clears throat> on the ground floor, the first floor, n equals 1 of our apartment complex, there's only one single one-bedroom apartment. So this apartment is like upside down. It's like an upside down pyramid. It's going to get bigger as we go up. In the second energy level, or the second floor of the apartment, there is one one-bedroom apartment, and there is one three-bedroom apartment. So within the one-bedroom apartment, uh, we have two electrons that can fit there, and in the three-bedroom apartment, we can fit up to six electrons. And what we can say here is, let's say I had five electrons that were going to fit into this 2p orbital. Well, these are three beds, and let's pretend that the electrons don't know each other. So if they don't know each other, they're not going to share a bed until they're forced to. And that's how we fill um, these orbitals, is we go through and when uh, we everybody gets their own bed until there's no room left and we have to start doubling up. So if there were three p orbitals, there would be another arrow pointing up here. If we had four p orbital electrons, then we would have to start doubling up and we would start having something that looks like this up here. Um, and then from the p orbital, we can go to the d orbital, which has five bedrooms which would hold 10 electrons. And then the f orbital has seven bedrooms, which would hold 14 electrons. And we'll look on the periodic table, and this will make a little bit more sense. But I just want to go through um, kind of the, the naming of how we do this. So again, <clears throat> when we look at what's going on here, we have the orbital diagram for something like neon. In the orbital diagram for neon, right, we have electrons in our 1s, our 2s, 2p isn't filled. So we can start seeing how these arrows will go up and down. Um, when we write this out, obviously writing a bunch of boxes and arrows could be very, very challenging. Um, instead, we often um, opt to uh, make a uh, short hand version of it and that's where we start writing them out like this and so this is visually uh, written based off of what we would see in the boxes so 1s2 would mean in my 1s shell I have two electrons 2s2 would mean in my 2s shell I have two electrons 2p6 would mean in my 2p shell I have six electrons if this electron wasn't here this would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. So um, it's just visually uh, inspecting the orbital diagram and then uh, writing out what we see. Obviously, um, as you go further down the periodic table and have more and more electrons, these uh, configurations, these electronic configurations, can get very, very, very long. And so we have the ability to abbreviate them where we can go, okay, if I had a noble gas, that noble gas would stop here, and that would be one um, uh, kind of set. And so instead of writing all of this out, I can put uh, a ne bracketed neon in its place and then I just have to write out the rest of it. Um, and this is simply done as a way to 
kind of be like shorthand for it. So here are some examples of um, different electronic configurations for different elements. If you go ahead and look on Google, it will organize them slightly differently. Um, Google has a tendency to organize the electronic configurations by the energy level, by the N, instead of by how much relative energy each of them has. So in this class, for our textbook, we organize our electronic configurations by energy. So 1s is lower in energy than 2s, 2s is lower in energy than 2p, so on and so forth. Um, and that's where we get that weird kind of up and down that we are seeing earlier. So I'm going to take some time um, to start talking about all of this in terms of this periodic table here. I would encourage you to have a regular periodic table out in front of you as well, one that has the elements on it so that we can do some practice together. I will call them out, but um, it's nice if you have a regular periodic table in front of you as well. So we talked earlier about those different um, kind of groups within the periodic table, right? We had the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, the transition metals. Here were like the metalloids, right? Um, and over here are non-metals and things like that. So we're going to kind of have a new way that we can kind of represent the periodic table. And that is that these two columns over here would represent any s orbitals. The columns over on this side, these six over here, represent p orbitals. The transition metals represent our d orbitals. And then the um, lanthanides and actinides represent our f orbitals. And they actually sit right here. Um, again, remember the periodic table is much, much wider than we think it is and that we just kind of take these guys and put them down here so it's easier to manage. So let's put this into practice. That's really the best way to do it. So I'm going to look at, for example, um, the element oxygen. So oxygen on the periodic table, if we were to look at it, would be um, um, right here. Oops, sorry, right here. This guy right here, right where um, my cursor is. This is oxygen. So let's try and take a walk along the periodic table to kind of help us um, figure out what oxygen's electronic configuration would be. So I'm literally going to take my finger and I'm going to go across the periodic table. I'm not crazy that they threw helium over here. I understand helium is part of the S block, so we leave it over here, but I like to write my finger across. So 1s1, a single electron, 1s1 would be hydrogen. 1s2 would be helium. 1, 2. I'm in the S block and here is my period number. 1. This is equivalent to n equals 1, n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. S1, 1, S1, 2. I go all, you know, helium's over here. Okay, I've hit the end of this period. I move on to the next one. Now I'm at 2S1, 2S2. Okay, I move across. I haven't hit the D block. They're down here, so I'm going to go straight across. I'm still in the second row, so this would be 2P. 2P1, 2P2, 2P3, 2P4. So the electronic configuration for oxygen is 1S2, 2S2, 2P1, 2 3, 2p, 4. So let's count how many electrons that was. We counted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. When you look on the periodic table, a neutral atom of oxygen has the atomic number of 8. We know that the atomic number is the number of protons in the element, but if it's a neutral atom, it's also the number of electrons. So all eight of those electrons now have little spots that we know that, live, that they live in. Let's try a harder one. Let's try chlorine. So chlorine would be over here. Again, we start by taking a walk across the periodic table. 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2. All right, we're going to go across 2, 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, 2p6, 3s1, 3s2, 
3p1, 3p2, 3p4, 3p5, 3p6. We're at chlorine. So again, as we go through this, we would just follow this trend and take, just keep going across. So as we come up to n equals 4, we see we now we're going to hit the transition metal block, the D block. The D block starts at the 3. So the, one, the S block started at 1, the P block starts at 2, the D block starts at 3, the F block starts at 4. So it always starts one later. So as I'm going across 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, I'm down here now, 4S2, now I'm going to hit my 3D, and I have 10 of them. Remember, the D block had five bedrooms, which means we could fit 10 electrons in there. And then we're back to the 4P. So using the periodic table is a lot easier to try and memorize or work with the different systems that will go than this pattern here. 1S1, 1S2, 2S1, 2S2, 2P6, right? 3S, 3P, 4S, 3D, 4P. This does not seem very logical to me. I prefer looking at a periodic table to be able to help memorize that. So, <clears throat> as we go across the periodic table, we'll find out that um, these different electrons, uh, or this different number and arrangement of electrons, is going to be the thing that dictates um, what chemistry can be done. And really, the, the bulk of the chemistry is done by the outermost shell of electrons, the electrons that are on the outside. These electrons on the outside are called valence shell electrons. Um, and basically, the valence shell are the electrons that are going to have the highest energy in that atom and are going to be the ones that are most readily to, going to be able to go do in some, some work, go do some chemistry. So for example, look on your periodic table and find phosphorus. So if we were to find phosphorus on the previous slide, phosphorus exists right here. Oh, sorry, right here. Um, so if we were to walk, take a walk across the periodic table to figure out the uh, um, electron configuration for this atom, we would start up here and go 1s1, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1, 3p2, 3p3. That's exactly what we have here. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. Now I've highlighted the 2 and 3 here to represent the valence shell electrons. They are the electrons on the outermost layer of this atom. So when we look at this, the 3s and the 3p, they are in the n equals 3 orbital. They're going to have the highest energy and therefore be the valence shell electrons. The maximum number of valence shell electrons that an atom can have is 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Even if we had d orbitals going on here, we're still going to have some p orbitals, um, most likely, whether it's p from the 3p with the 3d or the 4p. Either way, um, this is one row underneath uh, the row that comes before it, so it's still not the outermost level. So the 4s and the 4p are going to be our valence shell, or excuse me, the s and p are going to be our valence shell electron um, shells. Um, <clears throat> if we're looking at the uh, s orbital um, elements, so things like helium, lithium, sodium, that kind of thing, or if we're looking at alkaline earth metals where we have beryllium, magnesium, calcium, so on and so forth, they only exist in the s orbital. So at most they could have two valence shell electrons. As we go across the periodic table, we can kind of count how many valence shell electrons things are going to have. Anything that is an alkali earth metal is only going to have one valence shell electron. Alkaline earth metals are going to have two valence shell electrons. 
Then over here, three valence shell electrons, four, five, six, seven valence shell electrons, eight valence shell electrons. Now, when something acquires eight valence shell electrons, we say it is very stable. Eight fills up all these little compartments that needed to be filled, and what ends up happening is this helps stabilize the atom. This is why noble gases, which is this family over on this end, on the right-hand side of the periodic table, are relatively inert. They don't do much because they're very, very stable. And we're going to learn that pretty much all electrons are trying to um, get to this stability. So every, or all, excuse me, all atoms are trying to get the, to this eight electron stability. So they are all trying to either gain or lose or share enough electrons to get to eight valence shell electrons. So all of these have one elect valence shell electron, two valence shell electrons, three valence shell electrons, four valence shell electrons, five valence shell electrons, six, seven, and eight. We'll talk more about electronic configurations and their orbitals a little later. We don't need to go into too much detail right now. Um, we just want to bring up that um, these orbitals exist and that this is a way that we organize them. We will need to understand them a little better when we get to chapter four to discuss things like um, how ions form, how bonds are formed. But right now, um, we just want to get familiar with being able to count them, count electrons, be able to write an appropriate configuration for them. One of the last things we're going to talk about in this chapter are some other periodic trends. So things like atomic size or radius, sometimes it's described as um, for general trends within um, the valence shell, or excuse me, within atoms on the periodic table. Um, now this does have to do with the valence shell electrons because the valence shell electrons are the outermost edge of the atom. They're the furthest out from the nucleus. So wherever the valence shell electrons lie is kind of the defining border of the atom. And so it's really a measure of how far away atoms are from the rest of um, the nucleus, and the, or excuse me, how far away electrons are from the rest of the nucleus. So um, there are two general trends going from top to bottom and from left to right. Um, the top to bottom, most people are pretty comfortable with understanding the periodic trend that occurs here. Remember that um, as we go down the periodic table, it's like we're getting further and further away from the nucleus, right? N equals one, N equals two, N equals three, N equals four. We're getting more and more shelves on our bookshelf. We're getting further and further away from the nucleus, which means the atom would have to be getting bigger and bigger. It's like adding a new layer, like an onion, a new layer of an onion every time we go up an N level. And so most people are pretty comfortable with the concept that as we go from top to bottom in general, the atoms uh, increase in their size. The one that's more challenging is going from left to right. As we go from left to right, atoms have a tendency to decrease in size. And this one's hard because you might be saying to yourself, well, I know that if these are all neutral atoms, that means that the number of protons and, neutron and uh, electrons are the same. And as I'm going across the periodic table, I'm increasing my atomic number, so I'm increasing the number of protons and electrons in there. So why would it be getting smaller if I'm adding more stuff in? Well, we need to think about what those protons and electrons are. They're positively and negatively charged subatomic particles, right? So they are attracted to each other. And so what actually ends up happening is the more uh, positive and negative uh, charges that are around each other, more tightly they pull together. So here's a good example that you can see in uh, N equals 4, that when we only have a few relative to the rest of the row, um, charges, positive and negative charges, protons and electrons, the electrons kind of are able to float away from each other a little bit more. But as we get more and more charges, positive and negative charges from protons and electrons, they begin to get tighter and more closely knit together. 
So as we go from left to right across the periodic table, the general trend is that the um, atomic radius will get smaller. Now there are exceptions to these rules, and for test purposes we will not be going into those exceptions in any great detail. Um, they might show up on your homework, but again you have a lot of opportunities to look through that. So I'm just going to leave this here as kind of a um, a question for you to kind of go through on your own and and uh, argue through and then uh, you can either ask me in office hours or next class about um, if you have any questions about it. Um, but we know, right, we have these different groups uh, in the periodic table. They all have their names. And I want to ask you, why do elements in vertical columns have similar properties? So why is it that um, lithium and sodium behave similarly? Why is it that oxygen and sulfur behave similarly to each other? So especially lithium and, so, uh, and sodium, they both react very, very violently in water. Why does this happen? Why do we see this familial trait? The hint I will give you is to write both of these um, uh, atoms in their ground state electron configurations. So when we say ground state, that's another word for just the neutral state. Um, so it's the most uh, uh, lowest energy form of it. So that would be equal number of protons and electrons. So you would be able to figure out for sodium um, how many electrons are in it and to write out an electronic configuration. So that would be a 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Okay, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3p1. Let's do lithium now. 1s1, 1s2, 2s1. So we have a 3s1 and a 2s1. Those are both the valence shell electrons for those atoms. They both only have one s orbital electron in each of them. In fact, all of these alkali metals only have one valence shell electron in their s orbital. And that is what drives the similarity in how they um, run or do chemistry, I guess you could say. I, like I said, I'm going to leave this up for you to kind of munch on, come up with some arguments for or against or um, explanation and uh, either through office hours or through class time. Um, if you have questions about it, we can discuss. The last trend that we're going to talk about is uh, uh, ionization energy. And this will be really important for our next chapter. Um, ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from an atom. So up until now, we've kind of talked about how electrons are owned by um, the atom that uh, it, it belongs to. But we know that ele electrons go to do the chemistry. And sometimes electrons will either be added to, you know, given up by one uh, atom and added to another. So we need to talk about how likely that is going to happen. And that's done by how much energy is required to remove that um, electron from an atom. So as we go down the periodic table, the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron um, will decrease. And this shouldn't be terribly hard to think about. Remember, as we go down the periodic table, the atom is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So the distance from the nucleus where the positive charge is to where the negatively charged valence shell electron is gets bigger and bigger as well. So they're not held as tightly together as they are when the atom is smaller, like up on the top end of the periodic table. So it takes less energy to rip off an electron on a potassium atom than it does to rip it off on a lithium atom. That one makes pretty much sense. And as we go across the periodic table, ionization energy will increase. The easiest way to describe this is, remember, over here are our noble gases. They have eight valence shell electrons. They are nice and happy and lazy and in their ground state. As we go across the periodic table, we are getting closer and closer and closer to eight valence shell electrons. An atom that has seven or even six valence shell electrons isn't going to want to give up any more valence shell electrons. It actually wants to add them. It's so close to eight. Uh, 
It's much easier to add two valence shell electrons than to lose six, or to add one valence shell electron than to lose seven. So their ionization energies are much, much higher because they don't want to give them up. They actually want to add more electrons to them. Okay, that is the end of our chapter three um, lecture slides. I want to encourage you to look over your homework as well as the reading. And um, from there, we'll be able to um, kind of talk about this a little more. In the unit one resources are a lot of really good videos that will kind of help you with electronic configuration um, with some very nice animations on how to take a walk, quote unquote, across the periodic table. Um, so reach out if you have questions, take an opportunity to try and go through this a few times, this video, pause where you need it. And I look forward to your questions.